we entered the city by the Avenue Jules Ferry, a magnificent tree-shaded boulevard named in honor of the French statesman responsible for the occupation of Tunisia. Since the coming of the French in 1881, a new modern Tunis has been built, quite apart from the original native city, so that today there are two distinct centers, French and the Arab. And the Tunisian may adapt himself to Western civilization if he chooses, or retain his old mode of living within the Oriental town. The Avenue de France, favorite promenade and important business thoroughfare, leads to the Porte de France, the principal entrance to the old city. Beyond the gate is the Place de la Bourse, a small square which is the terminus of the two main native thoroughfares. We wander through the native streets of the city that was built largely from the ruins of ancient Carthage and Utica. Graceful minarets rise above the mosques which are closed to Christians and unbelievers in accordance with the promise made by the French at the time of their invasion. Lay down your arms and we will respect your mosques. Resist us and we will desecrate them. From the palace of the bay, we look out upon the housetops of Tunis, which at sunset will be crowded with women, as men at this hour remain below, lest they see the uncovered faces of their neighbor's wives. The baker chooses a busy spot in the open, and there sells his unwrapped bread. But the sweetmeat maker carries his confections about and sets up shop wherever he finds the customer. Sticky candy made from dates and nuts. This tiny kitchen is large enough to serve a small restaurant and an open air cafe. Perhaps the most interesting parts of the Medina are the soups, the roof covered lanes where artisans make and sell their wares and merchants display various articles to tempt foreigners. As is the custom of the East, trades generally keep together, a decided advantage to the purchaser who can compare prices and quality of similar articles. The streets are often named after the wares that are sold in them. This is the street of the shoemakers. The white robes and the black mask-like veils of the Muslim women create an impression of eeriness, which is perhaps the most lasting of all that we carry with us when leaving Tunis. For over three centuries, and prior to France's occupancy in 1830, Algiers was the stronghold of those dreaded terrors of the sea, the Barbary pirates, and now is known as the Paris of North Africa. The old Arab city and the French ones surrounding it rise directly from the shores of the harbor. Bedouins from the desert wait for a bus to carry them to southern Algeria. Fine buildings face the harbor along the boulevards Carnot and République. The Rue de Constantine is but one of the many imposing streets in the European quarter. Along some, arcaded sidewalks have been built, offering shelter from rain or the hot African sun. The mosque, Jama el Jadid, in the Place du Gouvernement, like all other mosques in Algiers, may be visited by unbelievers. Buses roll in from everywhere, packed capacity both inside and out. A thriving business is always done, as the Algerians have to succumb to the mad pace of modern motoring and without caring where they go, will often spend their last franc on a pleasure ride. A shack from the desert takes in the sight. Muslim women in Algiers continue to wear the veil and run for cover when the evil eye, a camera, appears. Little equipment is required for the barber's trade. A chair, a razor, and the victim are all that are needed. The barber is also a dentist, as a few of his extractions testify. The Kasba Quarter appears today very much as it did when the pirates ruled and pillaged Mediterranean shipping. Many of the narrow streets 
which zigzag up and down through the hilly town, or merely a series of steps. No vehicles can enter the Casbah Quarter, so all trucking must be done with small donkeys. Over some of the streets, the upper stories of the houses meet. Through these narrow lanes passes a continuous stream of picturesque traffic, almost as unchanged in appearance as this unaltered main portion of old Algiers, the one-time stronghold of the pirates of the Barbary Coast. The most conspicuous landmark of Rabat is the unfinished Hassan Tower. From its summit, we look down upon the walled city of Old Rabat, situated at the mouth of the river Puregre on the Atlantic coast. Across the river is Saleh, once the principal slave market of Morocco. The walls of Old Rabat are still well preserved and effectively separate the Moorish city from the modern French one. Old Rabat was the key city of Morocco, for many of the caravan routes to and from the interior converged here. The bazaars have long been famous for the great variety of their wares and for the workshops of artisans whose products of leather and wool are known throughout Morocco. Native doctors have no offices, so hold consultations in the busy streets. There are not only doctors, but druggists as well. And before them are the medicines, the herbs and charms which are prescribed. The stalls of the merchants are so small that the largest part of their business has to be conducted in the street, a none too appetizing butcher shop. One slightly better. A grocery. a spice merchant. The flowing cloak-like garment worn by the Moroccans is called a burnous. The ancient method of carrying water is still in use. A drink for a thirsty one. Some of the streets in the bazaars are covered with palm branches or reeds and grass laid upon trellises. Many of the artisans work in these covered souks. begin learning a trade when young. Shifting thread to their masters, the tailors, who work far back in dark shops sewing patterns on burnouses, a style of hairdressing appropriate for the hot weather and also convenient when Allah grabs and pulls them into heaven. Just outside the walls of Old Rabat is the palace of the Sultan. Descendants of the famous black soldiers of the notorious Sultan Mullah Ismail guard the residence of the man who now, under the direction of the French governor, rules the once independent empire of Morocco.